Now we can get started with the webinar proper. Today's session is on the cost of inaction and how to make the case for reform. The objective of this webinar is to give some concrete examples of how to make the case for policy reform in several sectors, including water, but also air pollution and other sectors. We will hear from studies on the cost of inaction undertaken by the OECD, how they were conducted and why that was interesting for their member states, as well as a recent study conducted by Adelphi and Carec and published within the framework of Switzerland's Blue Peace Central Asia Initiative, entitled Rethinking Water in Central Asia. With this short introduction to the topic of today, we are now ready to start with the webinar. First, I'd like to take a moment to introduce the people involved in the organization of the webinar. So my name is Melissa Norton. As I said, I work for SCAT and I'll be facilitating this session. We have several presenters joining us today. Uh, first up will be Dr. Elisa Lancy, who is based at the OECD in Paris and who will present some work conducted within the framework of the CIRCLE project led by the OECD. We're also very happy to have with us Dr. Iskandar Abdulayev, who's the director of CAREC and one of the authors of the study uh, on the cost of inaction on water resources management in Central Asia. And we will, and who is based, who's joining us from Almaty in Kazakhstan. And we will also hear from Dr. Benjamin Paul from Adelphi, who's the lead author of the study on the cost of inaction and benefits of water cooperation in Central Asia, rethinking water in Central Asia. We also have with us Jean-Gabriel Duce from uh, the Swiss, Development, uh, Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, who is the thematic lead uh, who helped organize this webinar, as well as Sandra Brühlmann, who's the réseau focal point for the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, who is also involved in the organization of this webinar. In the background, we have Martin Lang, who's helping us with all the IT and organization of this webinar. Before we get started with the presentations, and this, since this is the opening webinar of a series, I would like to give a few minutes to Sandra Brühlmann, who's the focal point for the réseau, to present very briefly what the réseau is and what it does and what the, the, the objective of this webinar series is. Sandra, over to you. If you allow me, I will just put up your slides very quickly. Thank you very much, Melissa. Um, thank you all for joining this, this first webinar of a series, as Melissa already mentioned. Um, SCC, uh, the SCC Réseau is actually the, the water network uh, within SCC, and it consists of uh, different um, partners as well as SCC field staff um, from the humanitarian aid, from the global cooperation, but also from the east and south cooperation. Let me just briefly go back a few slides. Um, I'm sorry. I hope it's working now. My slides are loading. Um, so what is the objective of the réseau? Um, it's actually to, to exchange within each other. So we really want to facilitate exchange of knowledge, of know-how, of best practices, etc. within the réseau, within partners, but also within um, STC staff. And we also want to, to ensure that we actually have a portfolio which is really strong, which is coherent and also trend setting within STCs, but also for partners. So what is the structure of the réseau a bit? Um, it's anchored in the global program water. So I am currently the focal point and, and uh, responsible for the overall organization and coordination of the, of the réseau. And then we also have a réseau core group consisting of different um, partners or different um, regional advisors within STC from um, the MENA region, from Central Asia, from the Balkans, Latin America. Um, so we have basically everything more or less covered. Our main instruments, This today's webinar is one of our instruments, but we also have uh, the water team days, which uh, some of you might have already attended. We have a, a global water team days usually taking place in Bern every second year. And we also have um, regional water teams way, team days, which we try to, to also push a bit more um, in, in different um, areas. So we're going to have one in, in Central Asia together with climate change this year, still in September. And we're going also to have one in Latin America and trying to set up also sub in the MENA region and Africa. So you can also exchange more within the regions. 
We also have a share web um, where all the information is available. And I think this webinar afterwards is also going to be uploaded on the share web and is going to be um, there for, for your use. We also have uh, Réseau updates and, and water news just to share information, be it on, on really ad hoc information on job openings, but also more kind of structural information on projects, etc. And as, as today's webinar, we have virtual exchanges through webinars and e-discussions. So you can find all these information also on the link provided. Um, this one I already mentioned, we have around 300 members currently from different constituencies. And as I said, we have also um, sub um currently working in Eastern Europe and Central Asia and Latin America, but as I said, trying also to be set up in the Middle East and in Africa. Um, here you have a slight overview of also activities that we try or that we have done in the past, just to give you a slight idea of what we have done. So we've had in the past already webinars on what safety plans, um, a pilot uh, in Tajikistan. We had also different trainings or regular exchanges. As you can see, I'm not going to, to go through this. So in case you have any questions or you want to become part of the Rezo and are not yet, you can contact me. So that was it. And I wish you um, a very pleasant webinar from my side. I hope you can learn a lot. It's a very interesting topic, uh, the cost of inaction. So I'm happy to give it the work back to Melissa. Thanks a lot, Sandra, for this uh, brief introduction. Um, we will now have the pleasure to hear from Dr. Elisa Lancy, who's our first uh, speaker. And uh, she joins us from the OECD. Uh, Dr. Lancy is a, an economist and policy analyst at the Economy Environment Integration Division of the OECD Environment Department, where she works on modeling and outlook for environmental policy analysis. At the OECD, she currently works on the economic consequences of policies for transition to a more resource efficient and circular economy. Previously, she was working on the economic consequences of air pollution and climate change, which we will hear about today, and on the competitiveness impact of climate policies and climate change adaptation. Dr. Lanzi, over to you. I'll just upload your slides very briefly. Thank you very much, Melissa, and thanks, um, Rezo, for the organization of this webinar. Um, as Melissa said, um, Sorry, is there any chance you can put the slides back from the beginning? Sure, give me one second. You need to take over as presenter after me. There you go. Um, sorry. So I'll, I'll be presenting basically on, the, um, on our work on economy environment interactions and um, in particular on a large project we've been working on for the last years on the cost of inaction. Okay, I'll... Sorry. Yep, so the project was called CIRCLE. Uh, and that stands for cost of inaction and resource scarcity, consequences for long-term economic growth. And um, the idea of the project was to calculate the cost of inaction in a quantitative way, so really try to quantify how changes in environmental quality, climate change, natural resource affect the economy and prospects for long-term economic growth. So this was really at the demand of our member states to try and uh, show that environmental damages actually affect growth and um, to therefore motivate better policies in the field of environment, in the different fields of environment. Um, as I said, we take a quantitative approach and um, wherever possible we couple that um, with more general insights. And in particular, we try and quantify market costs in two different ways. The main one is to assess market impacts with a production function approach within an economic model. And then for the impacts that do not enter the GDP directly, we take uh, a valuation approach. But um, I'll take a little bit more time before I get to show some results to 
and the methodology to to really make you understand what we're, what we're trying to do with this project. So if we take long-term economic growth, they're generally assessed with GDP, but this GDP is linked with a large number of environmental damages, and these can also be quantified. And in certain cases links to different components of the GDP. So in that case, you can create an alternative and in a certain sense more corrected projection of GDP, which takes into consideration these environmental damages. And um, taking this as a reference case, you then can do cost of um, action assessments, um, which leads to a reduction of environmental damages and in next terms to benefits of policy action. So really the demand of our member states, we've been working on different environmental themes to try and assess what the cost of, uh, what this, let's say, corrected GDP is when you incorporate in the long-term environmental damages. And this, the aim of it was to really try and help them motivate policy action. So I'll now explain a little bit the methodology of what we've been doing, and we've applied a similar methodology to all the different environmental themes in the CIRCLE project. So we start with an economic model to create economic projections, as well as projections of indicators of environmental pressures. So emissions is one of the key ones. We then link these emissions to um, an environmental model so that we can calculate indicators of the states of the environment. So that's temperature changes for climate or polluted concentrations for air pollution. Then these are translated to impacts on the biophysical side with impact models. So that's, for instance, changes in crop yields or the incidences of illnesses. And uh, the last step is to use this biophysical impact to calculate the economic consequences, which are then looped back into the model to finish the overall assessment of the economic costs. So we've done uh, several reports with the three main uh, publications, one on climate change, one on air pollution, and one on the land, water, and energy nexus. So I'll explain a little bit of results on climate change and air pollution today. Uh, for climate change, we've created, as I said, projections to 2060, but already to 2030, we can see that there are some damages from climate change. They go up to 1% of GDP, um, and these increase to around three, up to 3% of GDP at global level by 2060. In terms of the main impacts that mm, uh, they come from health and agriculture, and increasingly so in agriculture by 2060. But there are also impacts that are due to changes in tourism demand, coastal zones, energy demand, and uh, extreme precipitation events. Um, so this is quite interesting in the context of the use of water because a large number of the impacts come from agriculture, which is, of course, strongly linked to climate change. In terms of where the largest amount of impacts take place around the world, um, the impacts in OECD countries are relatively low, when at least when looked at in an aggregate, in an aggregate way. And uh, in terms of the rest of the world, there are larger impacts in the Middle East and African regions and in South and Southeast Asia. It's important to bear in mind that there are large uncertainties, and uh, in this slide you see at least one uh, parameter of uncertainty, that's the equilibrium climate sensitivity that we use in the model, and uh, there are different ranges specified in the IPCC. And when you look at these ranges and use the different ranges, you can see that in some regions, and particularly in South uh, and Southeast Asia and in African regions, the damages can be really high and they can go up to even almost 7% of GDP. So that starts becoming quite a serious number. So these are just some of the results for climate change. And now I'll show some of uh, the ones relative our, to our work on air pollution. In terms of air pollution, one of the main results for us was the creating projections of premature deaths caused by air pollution. So we start to, with a reference number in 2010 of around 3 million, which have been calculated based on the global burden of the res disease results. And then when we look at projections, these can become really high, so up to uh, 9 million premature deaths. 
And uh, in particular, there are strong increases in regions such as China, India, and other Asian regions, but also in some OECD countries such as South Korea. There are also costs that are directly linked to um, GDP, and these come from additional health expenditures due to illness, labor productivity, and uh, agriculture. And uh, as you see, it, the health-related indicators cause the highest number of, um, of costs, and in particular in regions such as um, um, East Europe and uh, Asian regions, including China, for which the costs are higher than in the rest of the world. Now, what I wanted to show you as well is uh, some uh, results in comparing market and non-market costs. And this is particularly re relevant for some environmental topics and in particular for um, air pollution, uh, because there are so many impacts that are relative to health and um, premature deaths. So if we look at market impacts, it's interesting to see how some, uh, a large share of the market Im impacts and an increasing share over time comes from indirect costs. And this is important because it highlights the importance of looking at not just in accounting terms at the health ex expenditures, but also at the consequences that health expenditures and labor productivity changes have throughout the economy. For instance, through changes in consumption, uh, patterns or trade or um, in general production. But again, if we, as I said, if we compare the, non, the market costs to the non-market costs, um, the non-market costs actually occupy a much larger share. And that is quite a strong challenge in terms of presenting costs uh, to policymakers because the ones that you're trying to use in terms of um, GDP costs to justify policy action are are very relevant for a smaller share compared to the uh, non-market costs. So I'd like, before concluding, to highlight the challenges and implication of um, our project on the cost of inaction. In terms of the challenges that we've encountered throughout the project, uh, for us, because we're working at a global level, one big thing was the data sources, so of trying to find enough data on all the different impacts um, at global level for the different environmental themes, so climate change, land, water, use, and uh, air pollution. Um, then one challenge is matching the local environmental issues with the larger scale economic indicators. I'll give an example to clarify. So, for instance, the air pollution concentrations have health impacts mostly at local level. So it's really where the concentrations are high that people struggle and have, um, and then there are health um, impacts. But then you're trying to match that with the GDP at national level. So you're trying to, the challenge is to aggregate um, the local impact at, uh, at a national scale. Another challenge, as I already highlighted, was to present uh, market and non-market impacts together. And again, that's a challenge, especially for, for themes such as air pollution, but also biodiversity, once you try to model, for instance, ecosystem services. But on the other hand, you have lots of non-market impacts in terms of um, species being affected. And then there are challenges with missing impacts in data, and that's uh, quite challenging, as you know, for um, issues such as climate change, but maybe even more so for um, uh, for air pollution, for instance, for which the literature is really changing fast as new discoveries are made. So every other day there's basically a publication on a new impact coming from a different gas uh, or different types of impacts that uh, are related to air pollution. And to give an example, there are new studies that are highlighting the impact of air pollution in education, so um, kids that are affected by air pollution have lower results at school, and that in the long term affects human capital and therefore growth. Another impact uh, that we could not take into account, but it's uh, a growing evidence, is uh, the impact on pregnancy as well as health of newborns, which also has impact in the long term, as well as immediate impacts through health expenditures. So it's really hard to keep up with the literature and find enough data especially at global level to quantify all the all all the different health and environmental impacts. In terms of the impacts and implication of the project, 
we've had quite a large um, diffusion of results in both media and uh, um, academia that helped raise awareness and uh, interest in the topic. In some countries, uh, the impacts have been fairly high so that we've had large requests for more information on the project. Uh, one example is in South Korea, which is one of the OECD countries with largest impacts from air pollution. Um, then we've had applications of the circle approach by country. So we're hopefully going to start doing some of this from next year on, but we haven't really worked ourselves on country studies using the circle project. Nevertheless, we have talked with different countries. One example is uh, we've been talking at the Assemblée Nationale in France, um, and the, the results from the circle project on air pollution have then been used as inspiration to uh, fit into a large report on air pollution done by France. Um, then we have um, uh, also some um, results from our project that have been used at the OECD in the environmental performance reviews but for the different countries. So that shows an interest in the countries to also look at the future and calculate the cost of inaction in the future for the different countries. Uh, we also have interest in, continue, in continuing this work by our member states and in fact as Melissa already said we're currently working on a similar approach to assess uh, resource use and uh, the possibility to reach a more circular economy. And we're going to start next year on uh, um, policy actions for both air pollution, climate change and resource use using again the, the same type of methodology. Nevertheless, I'd like to highlight that it's uh, too early for us to assess real policy changes that this project could lead to because it's um, finished recently and we have not yet started uh, getting information from the different OECD countries on uh, what they've been engaging on in terms of um, assessing themselves the costs of inaction. Uh, with this, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present again, and I'll be here, of course, to answer any questions, and I'll give the word back to uh, Melissa. Thanks a lot, Elisa, for this really interesting and clear presentation and within the perfectly within the time allocated. So uh, that was really excellent. Um, we, we, we really appreciate it to hear from you on the the um the challenges associated with this work and also how how influential it was in terms of um uh influence on on, on policy uh perhaps in, in south korea or in france and, and so on even though it is too early for you to to say precisely what uh what consequences it has had um and i would like to remind our participants to feel free to ask any questions to the presenters in the chat box, um, either during their presentation or after their presentation. Um, at the end of all the presentations, we'll have a questions and answers session with, uh, with the, the presenters. Um, so feel free to type uh, in the box if you have any, any burning questions. So now we'd like to, to um, to pass the, the microphone to Dr. Iskandar Abdullayev, who is joining us um, from uh, Almaty in, in Kazakhstan, and who is one of the author of, uh, of a uh, recently published report called Rethinking Water in Central Asia. Dr. Abdullayev has over 25 years of experience in irrigation and drainage management, uh, water institution, allocation and distribution in Afghanistan and all five Central Asian countries. He has been working as director of the Regional Environmental Center for Central Asia, called CAREC, since uh, 2013. And prior to this, he worked on transboundary water management in Central Asia for many years. Um, he is also a founder of the NGO Association of Uzbekistan for Sustainable Water Resources Development. Dr. Abdullayev, uh, over to you if, you if you would like to speak now. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, colleagues, for giving me a chance to uh, show you the, some context of application of cost of inaction study in Central Asia. Uh, many of you know about Central Asia water resource management. Uh, it's very, very well known. Uh, one of the uh, signs of the problem is already emerged early 90s by the drying up the Oral Sea. So, uh, still, uh, there are a lot of other cases of huge environmental consequence of water resource mismanagement during the Soviet time. 
But after the independence, since 1990s, also the region has been in the hotspot of the water resource management and have been focused by many researchers looking into the transboundary aspects of water resource management. As you can imagine, this, uh, almost all water sources of the region is uh, generated in the two big rivers, Amu and Sildaria, which has a transboundary nature. And um, most of the time, the countries, five stands and plus Afghanistan, six countries, are taking water from these two big rivers. There are a few, uh, uh, few issues which we have to pay attention while we're speaking about the environmental and water problems. The region, first one is demographic pressure, is growing population. Uh, currently, Central Asia, home of 60 million people, and by 2050, it will be around 90 million. So quite a, uh, quite a growth of, of, of the population. On top of it, uh, the region is rich with natural resources and all five countries are building their uh, economies and economies based only on the, most of the time on the natural resource development. Like if you look today around 400 billion uh, US dollars GDP uh, total annually, it's growing uh, about five to six percent every year. So economic pressure is, is, is serious uh, and also countries are actually competing for resources. First of all, of course, for water resources. Uh, also, the economy has been, uh, have been, of course, intensively reformed, but still it's, it's one thing, a uh, sign of the Central Asian economy is, is high footprint of resources, which is the development mode means more using of resources. Therefore, I think we can, uh, can, can see the late years of the, after independence, even countries starting to use more and more water resources. Um, the big, uh, uh, big problem, which is also known to the international partners, is infrastructure problems, which is outdated and dilapidated, a lot of leaks on the infrastructure. But not only infrastructure is big, because Of, 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 the, of the water sector is still past dependent and is, it's based on centrally planned uh, economy <clears throat> but they have been not reformed and policy is most of the time inefficient and it's not uh, really initiating changes in the sector. These are really the outlook of <clears throat> how water sector have been so far uh, assessed. But uh, we are uh, newly starting in the region also uh, witness the new challenges. We call it new challenges. First of all, the big one is, is, is climate change. The different studies show that there will be serious reduction of the water flow. There are many, many numbers have been presented to 20%, 15%, 30%. But one thing is clear that one of the new challenges will bring to the region that the transboundary water resources, two rivers, will have a reduction of the water flow in the future. But also, as we have seen, the economy is growing, and also uh, population growth is, 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 is in place, so you will also witness increase in water demand. So these are the, these are the two uh, serious consequences of climate change, it means uh, more flow is needed and uh, water flow is needed, but at the same time you will witness the reduction of the flow. If you see the, the major, 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 uh, major trend in the, in the water sector, and we, uh, we call it the intersector or interstate competition, it really uh, assigned to two big sectors of the economy. One is agriculture, food production. Second one is energy production. So the, we call it winter versus summer or regime uh, conflict between the, between the riparian states, so the upstream countries tend to develop more energy development for their economy, uh, but uh, low stream countries or downstream countries are traditional irrigation ones. So this is the one of the intersectoral interstate competition examples. But also always, uh, even the Soviet time, there was a clear example of competition between environmental needs or environmental flow and economic growth. So more or, more or less you can see consequence of such competition is drying up the, up the RLC and many other lakes and small uh, wetlands which have been drying out because of overcoming economic need. And of course, uh, more and more we also witness in the region reduction of per capita water availability. Uh, we see that if in comparison in the 1960s and 1970s, today's Central Asian uh, population 
uh, will use C times less water per capita. So this is really a competition type of uh, status in the transboundary basins. Uh, but uh, on top of it, we also witnessed this last 25 years big transformations happen in the region, in the water sector. And if we, if we divide the water sector into three parts, like everyday water management or local level water management, state level water management, and interstate water level, we see that in all three levels happen the political, social, and economic transformations. If we look at everyday water management, the former times or Soviet times, we had agriculture, which we call the collective agriculture. So may, mainly you had the responsibility of collective farms to manage water resources and also land. Currently, uh, all of uh, five countries have distributed land to users. There are, of course, different types of, uh, types of rights, but more or less you call about individual uh, production of agriculture and individual responsibility of farming. In this context, of course, you have a more of contestation more uh, of uh, competition for water resources. So effective institutions or water user associations are still uh, in, in process of development, therefore you have a lot of competition at the local level for water resources uh, distribution and allocation. At the same time, state policies have changed because in the Soviet time we had a more state-centric and, and authoritarian system, which was distributed the roles clearly to different states or provinces or republics uh, in Central Asia uh, and it had a lot of economic uh, clout on the daily work. Currently you have more state policies and economic political control. It's more open market in some countries like Kazakhstan, but still uh, competition, higher uh, levels of competition for water at the national level. And national policies actually uh, uh, recognize water as a national good in all five countries. That's also one of the reasons for the growing competition for water. If we come to regional level, now we call it hydropolitics, uh, here you have also changes happen because before you had the central power, Moscow, which was distributing water among five republics, Sastans. Currently you have uh, equal uh, five countries with different social political interests and economic interests in this level. These all three, three levels are linked and we have to keep in mind this all region, regional water cooperation uh, is actually not only happening not only at the regional level between five countries, it's happening everyday water management and it's happening, happening at the state level and also it happens at the regional hydropolitics. And sometimes misperception is if you improve only the hydropolitical, hydropolitics of the regional level, you may uh, reach the cooperation levels uh, effectively, but it's not, uh, not the case. So uh, we also, on, on this study, which my colleague uh, Benjamin Paul will uh, present you, we wanted to look, of course, uh, recognition that regional water cooperation had been happening the, during Soviet times. You have interstate in, uh, agencies which are looking for water distribution and allocation at the uh, basin level, bigger level, uh, between five countries. But still, there are some, uh, some inadequate level of cooperation. And, we tried to assess this and mainly we understood that uh, cost is very high. I am not going to give a number, I think uh, better Benjamin does it. But and also without comprehensive, holistic and systematic water cooperation, we will face serious problems, uh, mainly linked with uh, water competition. And I have shown you the reasons why water com competition will happen. And also very important that centralized approach uh, it, it's not the way, because most of the people say, okay, Soviet times it was centralized and it's maybe a better way to go back to centralized level. It's not going to work. I think more of bi basin wide agreements for two separate rivers could be an approach, because I think decentralization and more tackling issues on the, each basin will give good results. I will come for this, uh, this arguments later why. And then if we look uh, our our uh, approach on, on, on uh, disseminating the results of, of, of this cost of inaction report, of course, even in the beginning when we started to study, we had the national consultations, literature review, expert group meetings. Why we start from national level is very important that 
now currently in Central Asia context is that regional cooperation is outcome of five national level activities. If you can find a way to link five national water strategies, then you may find out ways of cooperation. It's not going to come back to centralized level that from the central decisions then you can lead to cooperation at the national level. It's not going to work in the region because the countries which are building their national identities and also independence, they are very sensitive to different interventions from elsewhere, especially from outside. And any uh, attempts to create supranational units and bodies and cooperation uh, approach is ineffective and it's given and shown the story, the history of uh, this uh, 27 years of cooperation in the region. So what we also have witnessed uh, since 1990s, there was a, there was a, some historical shifts on the cooperation. For example, in the beginning, these five stands or countries were trying to prolong Soviet period water allocation principles. Actually, it was the period when they were setting, re setting up regional institutions. And uh, more or less because of the quick collapse of Soviet Union, the countries have looked at water as a technical issue. Since 1990 until 2000, there was more or less continuation of the collapse, we call it, and just the continuation, prolongation of Soviet period water allocation principles. But once countries started to build up their, their nation, nations and nation building process, take a speed, then they started to seek for new arrangements and agreements. And actually, uh, we observed increased com contestation of water cooperation principles of the Soviet time. And like upstream countries, we are not happy with the economic outcomes of water distribution and allocation of Soviet times and trying to push politically, the politically blackmail the agreements. So starting uh, somewhere in 2000s until recently, I would say until two, three years ago, there was a, this is hard way of seeking new arrangements, agreements, trying to really contestate the uh, decisions and criticize the uh, regional institutions and actually question the neighbors, uh, activi neighbor, neighbors activities, the Palestinian state activities in the transboundary basis. But then we also now, uh, last two years, we are really witnessing new thing and I, I know maybe uh, still international con uh, partners and, and, and researchers do not recognize it fully but I think it is now time of pragmatic and effective solutions because countries understood that questioning and contestating the structure and decisions is not the way which will uh, give them some kind of decision. So recently there was a starting of difficult dialogues uh, is, is also one thing is very important that water became also security issue for the region and I think it is becoming more and more next stage of development when more and more pragmatic solutions will come back. For example, recently this um, dialogues between countries and setting up water commissions, bilateral and trilateral water commissions is good sign that there is, a, there is a, actually understanding and change in, in trend of of water cooperation in the region. I would say in the future more and more so-called nexus approaches like energy, water, uh, uh, agriculture uh, will, be, will be seen in the region. For example, even joint building of some infrastructure, water infrastructure, which will give more, more uh, outcome for, the, for the, not only for one country, but uh, the two or three countries. This, uh, this is really history of the trends we have to keep in mind while we are talking about this cost of inaction. Uh, implementation. The last but not least, I think now more and more dialogue which we witness in the region shows that the question is now about uh, now is not about how to share water but more about how to share benefits of water. That's really becoming clear like between Uzbek uh, Kyrgyz and Uzbek Tajik and also Uzbek Turkmen dialogues and Kazakh Uzbek dialogues on sharing the transboundary waters. And also, uh, one thing is clear in the region that there is no uh, good institutional solutions, unfortunately, and it's mainly we are tackling everyday water problems. So the shift should have to happen, and also we, in, also in this cost of inaction study, it's clear that you need to have institutional solutions if you would like to handle water problems at the transboundary basins. 
And also we looked long time water as it is and uh, mainly tried to solve water problems. But now time is that the, you know, all the policy makers in the region recognize water is part of economic and social transformations. It's only one part. So out of box, out of water box approach is very important. So the other thing is infrastructure. We couldn't uh, fully evaluate how much uh, joint infrastructure will cost and how benefits of this infrastructure will be. But one thing is clear that without infrastructure, uh, without rehabilitated infrastructure, the allocation and monitoring and distribution of transboundary water sources will be very difficult. Only goodwill and political uh, support will be not sufficient. And planning and strategy setting, long-term planning, it's very important. In two basins, last water planning have been happened in 1980s. So joint planning for both two big uh, two big transfoundry basins, but also other smaller basins is very key for sustainability in the future. And also assessing among this uh, planning strategy, also assessing benefits, potential benefits in the basin, which will be shared for the basin countries is also important. Also, uh, recognition is that Water will be not sufficient in the region. There is a lot of talks. For example, recent one talk is again coming back to the Siberian transformation of Siberian river waters to Central Asia. But I think the new water uses and not resources have to be uh, relooked. It's reuse uh, and it's also development of salt drought tolerant uh, and uh, um, drought tolerant crops and increase in productivity is key for the solution. If of course, climate change uh, on the water management and governance will be uh, also a big issue for the region, and I think regional institutions should tackle it. And uh, at the end, I just want to uh, highlight the one more point that I think that this is the now good time for the region. Maybe we call it windows opportunities where you have strong political will for cooperation, but still it's a long way to recognize how much we are losing because of and sufficient cooperation at the transboundary levels. I'll stop here, and if uh, you will have questions and listeners will have questions, I will be happy to address them. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Abdullayev, for this uh, very uh, good presentation on the, the context uh, in Central Asia and the challenges associated with uh, water resources management in Central Asia. I think it was very useful, uh, particularly because we have people joining us here today who, who may not be familiar with with the, the history of, of water resources management in Central Asia and the challenges associated. Um, and now I will, I will like to, to pass over to Dr. Benjamin Paul, um, who will talk about the study which, which Dr. Abdullayev introduced, entitled Rethinking Water in Central Asia. Dr. Paul is a senior project manager at Adelphi, a Berlin-based think tank on global environmental change and sustainable development. His research and consulting work focus on climate and resource governance and their relationship to foreign security and development policy. He is the lead author of the study Rethinking Water in Central Asia, the cost of inaction and benefits of water cooperation. Dr. Paul, over to you. Um, once we have your slides up. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Melissa, um, and good morning to everyone, and good afternoon to to, to all in Central Asia. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for the for the invitation to talk about um, the study that Karik and Adelphi wrote about rethinking water in, in in Central Asia. And now the slides are actually up, and I hope it it works. It does. So um, maybe to start out, why did we undertake the study? And I think one of the reasons is that uh, most experts will, you know, readily agree that transboundary water cooperation is is more beneficial than unilateral planning in transboundary basins. But still, in reality, what often happens is unilateral uh, planning, and that uh, reality includes Central Asia. So the idea was to ask, well, well, how much better could Central Asia do through closer cooperation? You know, if you look at the if you look at the situation today and compare it to a scenario of of close cooperation, what's the difference? And we called that difference the cost of inaction. So the difference between what we have and 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 what we could have. So. Inaction does not imply that there is no action or no cooperation whatsoever, but that there is a cost 
to uh, to keeping things as they are, much like the uh, the, the the earlier study on uh, by by the OECD, where you know inaction means n no action towards a better future. So the purpose of of our study is basically to help support the political rationale for for improving uh, water cooperation by, uh, cooperation by by raising awareness on on the improvement in well-being that that would be possible through through cooperation. How does the study do that? Uh, it has essentially three parts. So the first one is to ask why we find ourselves in uh, in the situation that we are in. Uh, in, in, in in Central Asia, and Iskandar has already covered this expertly. So I will focus on the on the second part, which assesses the the costs of inaction. You know, where is cooperation uh, insufficient, and and what does it mean? And uh, then the third part looks into the future and sets out sort of pathways towards you know, as to how the costs of inactions, uh, inaction could be reduced. Um, what methods did we, uh, did we use to do these three things? So we did not, uh, maybe to start off, we did not have the, uh, the resources and the time to do this, um, you know, comprehensive quantitative assessment that we, that we heard in the first presentation. Basically, what we, did, what we started out with was a literature review to assess what is known about uh, water conflict and cooperation in Central Asia. Then we did some, you know, some 20 uh, interviews with experts from the region or working on the region to, to better understand why cooperation is limited. And then CARIC set up uh, national working groups in four of the five countries. And these groups uh, sought to formulate per country perspectives on, what, on what's happening. And then the members of these working groups ident participated in a stakeholder workshop in, in Almaty. And um, there we asked the workshop participants to identify and prioritize transboundary water-related risks for the countries, also their cooperation priorities, and how, you know, how they could imagine fusing these different country priorities into a regional agenda. And the results of this then fed back into our assessment framework and the uh, scenarios uh, of the report. What are the limitations of this? I mean, the first one is, of course, you know, always data. Um, uh, there might be data, but it's it's it, 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 it's it's hard to um, access and it's hard to, to compare. And there was uh, just not very a lot of scope for um, primary quantitative research in, in our project. So for the numbers that we have, we basically relied on existing numbers, on, on reports that were out there and, you know, the proxies that we could find. Um, but of course, they're far from perfect. So it's a, it's a, it's a far less ambitious and, but also <laughs> far less costly approach than, uh, than the OECD one. It's, you know, not seeking comprehensive quantification, but, you know, just trying to give a political nudge to get people interested in, in the consequences of not cooperating. And, um, you know, there's all the, the second limitation, I think, was having a single workshop with all stakeholders meant that, you know, that workshop had to deliver both on the conceptual framework and then on filling out the conceptual framework, which of course is asking a lot uh, from one workshop. It was very helpful, but having, you know, several rounds of presenting interim results and then, you know, getting participants to give, give detailed feedback, you know, could have, you know, enhanced, or engaged the stakeholders even more and, you know, prevented potential misinterpretations and, you know, just in case someone is trying to redo this in another region, I'm suggesting that you know you have you, you build in more than one round of of, of stakeholder uh, workshops. Um, what are the what are these costs of inaction um, of you know of not cooperating more fully? Initially, we we drew on the work by the UN Economic uh, Commission for Europe, uh, which did a you know, uh, some conceptual work on establishing coast categories that we then asked the experts uh, in Central Asia to identify which ones were the most important ones for them. And we came up with uh, 11 categories that you can see here. I don't know how well in that circle, but certainly in the report. Um, so in the, in, the, in the upper left corner of the circle, you have the costs that are directly related to water management. You know, such as reduced agricultural productivity due to lack of water of sufficient quality, you know, the damages from, uh, from, from flood and, and mudslides. Um, and then going clockwise, you have indirect negative impacts, such as inefficient 
trade, especially in energy, but also in other sectors, and then, of course, constraints on countries' access to, um, to international finance as a consequence. And you have significant um, social and environmental costs, uh, impacts on livelihoods, on, on ecosystems. And, you know, as Elisa already described before, of course, these are very, very hard to, to, to quantify. And we didn't try, but you have this, you have similar um, knock-on effects, uh, you know, given the pollution around the, the RLC, of course, you have uh, effects on on newborns, on, on educational attainment, and so on and so forth. And ultimately, you have the, the in red, the, the the fact that non-cooperation might even foster instability and, and conflict. And what I would like to underline is, you know, that importance of indirect costs. And you saw that, again, already in the OECD presentation with, uh, you know, more numbers. Um, you know, the, the limited cooperation over water has, uh, has consequences that go far beyond water. And in Central Asia, it's most obvious for the energy sector because of, of the importance of hydropower. But these tensions are also just a general drag on, on investment because who wants to invest if water supply is not guaranteed or if there might be instability due to conflict over water. Um, so, and also there are many projects of, you know, mutual benefit that haven't been even thought about because, you know, there is this distrust over water. And these costs, because they have never been thought about, are, are almost invisible, but they are, they are big. So the, the point is that the true value of water cooperation is, is far bigger than the, the direct economic benefits of, of better water management. Um, how big are these costs? Um, you know, there's this famous number of more than, uh, or set of numbers of more than uh, 4.5 billion US dollars. And of course, that's a, it's a very fraud number and uh, making that estimate is, is, is very fraud. But what we did is basically identify three studies that calculated monetary values that could serve as proxies for three of the 11 cost categories. And so for agricultural losses, for inefficient electricity trade, and for lack of access to finance due to non-cooperation. And they are not perfect uh, proxies because they have very different methods and they don't exactly measure what we would like to measure. But, um, you know, they give you an, an idea of the scale of the costs. And that adds up to more than four and a half billion US dollars per year for the region. And it's also um, in the report you can see that each individual country would benefit significantly from from avoiding these costs. So they're also um, they're not totally equitably distributed, but they they affect everyone in the in the same direction. So now that's you know that's quite some money, but it's actually I think an, uh, you know very likely less than a true cost because we only, as I said, we only counted the cost for three of the 11 cost categories, and we only count part of that cost due to the nature of the proxies. And we also did not account for the interaction effects between these sectors. And the World Bank actually did a global level study um, uh, two years ago, which estimated the difference between good and bad water governance for Central Asia would add, add up to more than 60 billion US dollars by 2050. And um, it's a very different methodology, but um, the, the point again is that the, the quality of water governance, and that's you know corrob corroborated in, in a number of reports, that will have an enormous impact on, on future economic development in Central Asia, and more so in Central Asia than, than any other region in the world. Um, you know what are what are the uh, the, the scenarios? Um, Iskandar already sort of talked about the um, you know about the increasing pressures due to demographic growth, infrastructure deterioration, uh, climate change, and so on. Um, but you know the 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 scale of these costs also means that there are huge opportunities uh, if you implement better water management and, and closer cooperation. And the study sort of shows three general generic scenarios. One is um, uh, strengthened technical cooperation, you know, such as cooperation on, on dam safety, on, on, on joint early warning systems. So to reduce risks and costs that are, that are caused by, by seasonal uh, water scarcity and, and, and also seasonal floods. Um, the second one is sort of the reinforced sub-regional political cooperation, so not just technical but also political, which, you know, would be a complement to 
for example, govern uh, the, the management of specific infrastructure or, you know, coordinate water use, which goes beyond the technical question because, you know, it involves very political questions of who gets what and when. And then uh, the third one is sort of the reinforced uh, regional cooperation, which, you know, could provide that institutional and legal framework for joint management um, of basin resources. And, of course, that's, you know, perhaps in the more distant future because it will be very difficult to negotiate and implement. But in the longer run, you know, the, the more integrated the system, the bigger the benefits. Um, you know, and, and then we have these huge costs of inaction, but there are many crowns actually for optimism because, uh, as Iskander said, um, you know, Central Asian countries, at least since 2015, 2016, have created a, a very promising environment for, for reinforced cooperation. And uh, there are quite a few entry points for reinforcing that. Um, and the first one is sort of, you know, focusing on the, on the less contested issues that benefit all actors, you know, dam safety or improved irrigation e efficiency um, helps, helps everyone. Um, uh, but there's also the second, um, you know, approach of, of um, you know, embracing a, a very pragmatic approach, as, as is kind of said, not just trying to sort of get this top-down integrated research management going, which is probably asking too much, but, um, you know, doing it at the bilateral or trilateral or perhaps also quadrilateral level, um, that political and technical cooperation to facilitate um, joint gains. Um, and, you know, doing, doing this, as we dubbed it in the report, pursuing a, a polycentric approach to cooperation. So, you know, combining technical and political level approaches and combining also the, the different water-related topics such as irrigation energy, flood control, at the different scales, and trying to, you know, have if if one framework gets stuck as it has in the past, you still have others, it, you know, where 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 you can move forward and where you can, you know, make 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 things happen. And of course, it's also very important to to ensure um, compatibility and, and consistency with uh, with uh, with regional level. Um, cooperation efforts, so not as to not undermine with bilateral efforts what you try to achieve at the regional level. But I think it's a uh, it's a fixable problem, especially in the in the in the current context where where so many things are moving forward that seemed uh, almost intractable when we actually started that project in in, in 2016. So that was uh, the report in a nutshell. Again, um, uh, thank you very much for your attention, and please feel free to to ask any questions or send us comments. Or questions later. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dr. Paul, for this uh, this great uh, presentation, um, which was uh, very helpful for us to understand a little bit the methodology of the the report um, you have uh, co-authored, um, but also and see how different it is perhaps from a, from the OECD uh, approach, um, and and to understand the importance of the the participation of the different stakeholders in. Uh, in this report, um, and also to 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 see the perspectives that you that you see from from uh, from your side, um, for how how this will uh, translate into uh, action uh, at different levels, but also at different scales um, for for the region in, in Central Asia. So now that we have listened to all the the presentations, we would like to hear from from you to see if you have any any questions to our presenters. We have we have some time allocated for discussion, and I see that some of you have already been sharing comments and questions. So I would like to start with those. Uh, but feel free in the meantime to write some of the the questions that you may have to our presenters, and we will be selecting those questions um, to to pose it to them. So the first question we received is from André Verli, who is uh, asking this question to Elisa. And there's also a second question addressed to Elisa from Violette Rupaner. So I will ask them both together. Um, so André asks, um, 
a short question of clarification. Will your data set as it is allow for detailed analysis on the country level in specific regions, for example, in Central Asia, where air pollution is a rather ignored issue? And Violette asks for a little bit of, of uh, explanation. Could you please expand, expand on the non-market costs? Presumably, we are talking about negative externalities here. Isn't the crux of the matter that as long as these externalities are not internalized, policy action may be difficult, if not impossible? So, Elisa, if you'd like to take these questions together, um, please take over the mic. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And there are two very good questions. Um, so, on the first one, uh, basically, as I tried to explain, we're trying to match data that are really at local level with data that are more aggregate level. I'll give concrete examples on air pollution because I think it's the, uh, they're the most explicative ones. So, um, and um, sorry, and I also wanted to say I agree that in Central Asia there is a large problem for air pollution. And in fact, we had the launch of our air pollution report in Georgia, and um, we'll really try to do our best to highlight the importance of uh, air pollution for that area. So, <clears throat> sorry, to go back to the data issue. We start with the, um, we do our analysis and economic model, uh, so that is at macro level. Nevertheless, all the data that we use on the environmental side, so air pollution data as well as concentrations and the health impacts are at um, a country level. And they could also be done actually at an even lower scale level because the concentration data are at um, grid level data. Um, so you could indeed be doing the same thing at a more local scale. It's just that for us, we work with a global model and we need to have a global approach because that's what the OECD asks us for. So we try to match the two different levels. But otherwise, for instance, our results on um, premature deaths are at national level, not at macro regional level. So indeed, you could, uh, because the key indicator is concentration of pollutants, you could work at a much lower scale. Um, so I'll now address the second question, the one on market versus non-market costs. Um, all right, indeed, when you're trying to, um, to attribute a cost to uh, environmental damages, uh, you're looking at um, uh, internalizing the externalities. So you want to have a, a cost attributed to it. So for air pollution, for instance, you want to try to attribute a price on that pollution that um, is equivalent to the overall cost um, of that externality. So <clears throat> um, basically there have been, in, in the context of cost-benefit analysis, there have been studies and numbers available for policymakers for decades that can tell you how much to attribute in terms of cost to pollution. And of course, there's uncertainty, and those vary by methodology and uh, geographical areas, etc. but that's available. What we've been asked actually for is to, <clears throat> to isolate what part of those costs can be related to GDP, just GDP growth. So just growth, not the overall cost. And let me give you an example to better explain what I'm talking about. When you're uh, considering the health impacts of air pollution, one part of those costs is, for instance, health expenditures or uh, related to the cost of um, lower labor productivity. And then there's another part. So these are the ones that you can call market costs because they can be related to parts of the GDP. But then you have one part that is a cost from pain and suffering. Um, and that part is what we call non-market costs because it does not enter in any way uh, GDP. It's very relevant, of course, and if you want to internalize, like attribute a cost in terms of internalization of externalities, you need to consider the overall parts. But we have been asked in particular to motivate policy action to really see how the damages affect growth, not to, to give a cost to the overall externality. So I hope that answers the question. Elisa, for for this uh, this clear answer to the to the to Violet's question and to Andre's question as well, uh, we have some more questions uh, coming in for you. But before we we get to those, we'd like to also ask a few questions to the the other speakers. 
Um, and I would like to start with Dr. Uh, Abdullayev. Um, so in the presentation from uh, the OECD, uh, we heard that uh, one of the, the consequences of the of the reports that the OECD uh, produced was to raise awareness uh, with civil society, also with the media and, and academia. And I was wondering if if uh, on the side of the in Central Asia, if this was relevant um, to your work, uh, in particular with the release of this uh, of this report recently, how was was the process of working through the report, the stakeholder consultation, um, was it was it as helpful perhaps as the result of the report? And how um, how has media or academia or civil society taken up the the results um, the results of the of the report? Thank you. So this is for Dr. Abdulayev. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, yes, uh, we have tried to also disseminate the results or, or whenever we publish the, uh, the report, we have uh, uh, made few presentations. First, at the national level meetings. Uh, we had uh, several meetings in Uzbekistan and also in Kazakhstan, in one case in Tajikistan. And, uh, we presented the most uh, the, the presentations which we made with Benjamin together. Um, um, for the for the meetings and take up was very very very, very active, uh, mainly by the journalists because uh, Central Asia, as I told you, water is very sensitive issue and many articles came out uh, in one meeting in Tashkent. The ambassador, Swiss ambassador himself, given some explanation. So it was almost a few days. Uh, newspapers and uh, even TV have been informing about this report and refer referencing to it. And now, currently, we more and more face that in the meetings of the regional organizations, we listen a lot of the time reference to this report, saying there is an opportunity, uh, there is a cost if we not act. Overall, uh, was a positive feedback, uh, but also there were some some critical reviews. Uh, for example, one of our colleagues who are heading the regional organization on water cooperation have been have been giving quite. Uh, uh, quite uh, uh, remarks on, on the methodology. He was not happy that numbers which we present are not really based on really good methodology. He questioned numbers and also the, there was maybe misunderstanding of, of, of the purpose of, 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 the, of the cost of inaction. Our purpose was actually showing the opportunity if you in increase and improve uh, cooperation and it was received by some people or colleagues who worked at the regional level as a critics of current regional cooperation. So it's an ongoing process. We can't say it's now finished. We are having plans to make few more uh, few more presentations and also talks with stakeholders showing this report. So it's, it's, uh, it's uh, still an ongoing process. More or less, I think we had a lot of positive feedback, a lot of uh, good feedback. Many uh, researchers have requested us uh, more and more copies and download numbers of downloading is increasing. And I hope in the future we have a few events in Tashkent, in Dushanbe, and also Ashgabat that we will continue uh, disseminating the results of, of the study. Thank you very much. Uh, so it's 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 uh, good to hear that this uh, this has sort of uh, raised the the level of debate uh, around this issue in in Central Asia at national or regional level, and and has gotten people talking, uh, perhaps in a critical way about the report itself, but about the issue, and perhaps uh, even raised awareness uh, more broadly around around the the. The, the opportunities related to um, action or inaction on water resources management. Um, I would like to turn to uh, Dr. Benjamin Paul uh, from Adelphi, um, perhaps a little bit on the on the methodology. So, um, so there were some um, some people who perhaps didn't understand the, the purpose of the report, but the methodology itself, you were quite clear, I guess. I think in the in the report, in terms of its limitations um, and so on. And I was wondering, just uh, just kind of putting the the report of the OECD in parallel with the, with the with the one you you did on the on Central Asia. Um, this this number that you that you came up uh, with, how does it compare? Is it is it just 
at this moment in time? How will it evolve in the future? Have you, um, is this something you discuss in the report? How does it compare to the cost of GDP or projected GDP? Um, and yeah, is this something that you discuss in more detail in the report or, or is it just because you focused on this particular uh, moment? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. I, you know, it's a, <laughs> it's a good question. I, I mean, the number is, you know, actually it's a set of numbers <laughs> because um, and and I think that that was a that was a conscious choice also on our end not to say okay this is the number but to say well it's more than that because we already we know about that amount and we know there's quite a few uh, known unknowns that that should be added to that number and of course in that sense it's um, it's uh, you know it's 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 not very precise and uh, it's uh, and of course I admit that you know using then that number it, it gives a you know it, it serves as a priming thing and people actually pick out the number and say oh that's that that's the number but um, the, the report only treats the, the the future development of this of this uh, qualitatively basically saying as, as Iskandar also outlined you know given the pressures that we're seeing um, Continuing the the status quo is you know is um, means that the costs will rise by by default and will rise very substantially. But then saying well that you know default is is not destiny. It can be changed. You know that there's a, there's a lot of scope for um, uh, for for improving uh, water management and, and that involves also in, in improving water cooperation in, in in Central Asia now I you know it, it makes that argument qualitatively and I think that there, there would be you know an, an, an added value of, of, of having of having that discussion underpinned by the type of numbers that you know we, an approach a, a more comprehensive quantitative approach could produce and it uh, you know my my um, uh, my fantasy would be <laughs> that now Central Asians, perhaps with also with the support of of, of, of international organizations, take up that challenge and say, "Oh, uh, you know, like uh, we we uh, um, we're interested in these um, uh, find these in results interesting, but the methodology indeed is, you know, you basically." Um, uh, using old reports and and, and, and and connecting them to to this issue that's very interesting but let's have a proper modeling effort and and let's yeah, let's try to do that I, I that would be you know the perfect result for our report if we because that's in a way what we wanted to trigger we wanted to uh, to, to trigger that um, that political interest that nudge to say okay let's actually think about these uh, these costs of inaction of course um, after the publication, I, I've sometimes sensed some confusions about this concept of opportunity costs. I, uh, it's very intuitive, I think, to someone who's trained in economics in in, in the West, but the, I don't. I'm not sure whether it resonates quite as well in in, in in Central Asia. So, in a way, there's a cost to using the concept of costs rather than benefits. But you know, I, I think the the, the, the re reaction so far has been uh, has been good in the sense of you know. Triggering, triggering that interest, but yes, like comparing it to the OECD, you know, it's uh, approach. It's um, both approaches have their justification, are uh, complementary. You know, Our, one is cheaper and can, in principle, be done desk-based. But as as the bankers always say, there is there is no such thing as a free lunch. You know, it's a, there is a risk that a, a study where you don't do that modeling is seen as less legitimate, less scientific. Um, um, and I think to some extent we were able, thanks to Karek and its uh, and its stakeholder network, to, to circumvent that problem. But still, um, of course, if we could show a huge modeling um, exercise, then it would um, uh, would be harder to um, harder to criticize. But ideally, you know, that would be the second step, and it would the critics would, you know, join that that exercise and and, and try to actually model it. 
Thank you very much for this very uh, honest and candid uh, response to, to to my question. Um, I think we have uh, we have some more um, some more questions coming through, so I will uh, I will direct them to um, Elisa. So um, so we have a first question, which is a clarification from uh, from uh, Dr. Paul actually, who is wondering um, how come you expect such a huge increase in premature death by 2060, um, given that we may have already reached peak coal uh, at the global level. Um, I assume, and the second question is more uh, perhaps elaborate uh, for, for you to elaborate on. Um, asking from, from Jean-Gabriel Dus, uh, asking whether you have, you could share your experience um, on how to communicate effectively to inform policy making through these studies which are bringing new evidence and throwing a new light on important issues by linking economic and environmental models. What recommendations would you have um, for, for, uh, for others and what lessons have you learned from the CIRCLE initiative? Um, thank you very much. So Elisa, over to you. Hi again, thanks Melissa. So on the first question, uh, first of all, maybe I'll step back a second and uh, tell you how we create our projections in terms of uh, assumptions on energy. So we wanted to really reflect a scenario on cost of inaction. So we take the current policy scenarios from the World Energy Outlook of the International Energy Agency. And in that sense, uh, that scenario only takes into consideration the policies that are in place. So we can consider it as rather pessimistic. Um, it does not take, for instance, into account the uh, Paris target, but only the uh, carbon taxes that are already or other policies that are already in place. So that can already explain why we're relatively high in terms of um, assumptions on energy use and emissions. Um, but I'd also like to highlight that the, prem the increasing number of premature deaths is not only due to um, the use of energy and the emissions, but also to some economic development. So, for instance, there's in the future uh, we can expect an increasing um, uh, increasing level of urbanization, which means that the exposure there are there's a higher number of people that will be exposed to pollution. There is also, uh, to a certain extent, migration to, um, let's say, more OECD countries in which air pollution are sometimes higher than the origins, the origin countries. Um, so that, again, uh, means a higher number of people exposed to air pollution. And finally, one thing that we highlight in the report, um, and I'll be happy to clarify if you want to exchange by email later, um, there is an aging effect. So. One of the main drivers of the higher number of um, premature deaths is because populations are aging. And in countries, for instance, such as uh, uh, South Korea, where the impacts are really high, um, we find that um, um, uh, the higher number of um, older people then leads to also a higher number of premature deaths. So there are, it's not just a matter of energy assumptions, it's also um, really a matter of some uh, demographic projections that we take into consideration. Then, uh, the second question is really <laughs> a bit more challenging. So um, let's say there's, um, what we learned is, as I said, there is a challenge of basically trying to decompose the overall costs of um, of the environmental damages into a part that can be linked to GDP and a part that cannot. So for us, the choice, and we do not regret that one, so I would recommend it, is to really try to explain the different types of costs to policymakers and how they're both important. Um, in One thing that we, I did not include that slide and I regret it a bit, is we presented basically a jigsaw puzzle to policymakers and uh, to show them how the costs are really uh, coming from different parts, both agriculture and environment, market and non-market and so on. And that was actually quite helpful in, uh, in, in showing them what we were trying to do and then link that back to the conclusions. Um, another thing we uh, learned about was to yeah keep this part separate, but then trying to relate them both to each other and to um, to basically 
help policymakers understand the size of these costs by, for instance, relating them to specific numbers. For instance, the overall costs from, air, uh, from sorry, climate change by 2060 would be equivalent to the GDP of Mexico, if I remember correctly. So just giving ideas of how to relate numbers can be helpful, even if, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not 100 percent correct in mathematical terms, let's say. Um, so this is what we learned. One other thing that we learned and that we're trying to work on is that we um, we should improve our data visit skills. And uh, so I mean, I wouldn't take the Circle project as the ultimate um, as the ultimate reference. And we are really trying to still improve ourselves in uh, in how to um, explain such uh, complicated results because it's modeling and economic theory and energy and environmental damages. So there is a lot to explain. So we're really trying to still improve ourselves on it. I hope this is helpful. Thanks a lot uh, for this this great recommendation. So if I summarize quickly, um, it is good when you do this type of study to be able to illustrate the different types of costs uh, to policymakers in a way that is clear and understandable, perhaps uh, through, yeah, like you said, like a, a clear illustration or data visualiz visualization as well. And uh, what has helped as well in communicating uh, the cost to the to, to policymakers and to a broader audience is to relate those to uh, something that is tangible, like the GDP of a particular country, for example. So those are very, uh, very good uh, recommendations. Um, I think just, uh, just to come back also a little bit on what Dr. Uh, Paul was saying on the the methodology of the report which which uh, which they produce for for Central Asia we can see that um, the OECD has a very sophisticated approach of modeling uh, cost etc which people are perhaps less hesitant to to or more hesitant to to criticize and when they when whereas in in your case um, a more pragmatic approach was perhaps also criticized by some but at the same time triggered some discussion and and some um some uh, interest from from civil society from policymakers and because water as you said is a, is a sensitive issue this is also um a, a a good, I mean, a consequence, a direct uh, consequence of, of this cost of inaction approach. So this means that perhaps in different uh, situations, you don't have to always have a very sophisticated uh, economic model um, to have some useful uh, interactions with policymakers on these uh, on these topics. Um, and yes, it's, it's not the lack of a sophisticated um, economic model that can that can uh, deter people, that should deter people from having these conversations with, with policymakers um, at, at the regional or the national uh, level. We have uh, about five minutes left. So before we, we conclude, I'd like to ask the speakers if they have any final words, if they would like to share uh, something with us before we, we wrap up. So I will start with Dr. Abdullaev. Um, if you have any, any conclusions, any final thoughts, um, can you please uh, go ahead and, and say something? Thank you very much. Yeah, I would like to thank the organizers for this uh, webinar and discussion. Indeed, uh, we have to have uh, different tools. We have to have a sophisticated methodology and modeling. And also we have to have uh, also a stakeholder engagement and clear messages. Uh, maybe in the beginning, very um, preliminary uh, conclusions in order to start, because it's very important that stakeholders understand and policymakers accept this topic. Because I could uh, imagine if uh, we had a situation where we study, started our study in 2016, uh, we could not go far away. I would, uh, was expecting that a lot of criticism will come from countries because they don't accept this uh, analysis. But rather, these two years have been changed so much and then now we have even demand for such studies. As Benjamin said, uh, we, w we are expecting the next step, maybe somewhere in June in Tashkent, we will sit the people who have given critical comments to think about more of criticizing and may maybe applying more science-based approach. That's opening up good, uh, good doors for discussion for future. That's what I would like to also give as my last uh, sentence. Thanks a lot. Uh, I will ask also Dr. Paul, Dr. Benjamin Paul, if you have any final remarks. Please go ahead. 
Um, well, basically, no, 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 no final remarks from uh, from my end. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for organizing this. It was very interesting, also, also for me to, to have the discussion. And I hope it um, sort of it catches on, and we, uh, you know, we can continue to have these types of studies also in um, um, for for you know similar topics and in 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 other areas, or also for uh, for in the same areas, but for 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 different topics. I think they're very very important to have. So thanks a lot for organizing. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Elisa Lancy, if you have any, any final remarks or concluding remarks, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Well, I'd just like to say that we started this project um, very humbly and uh, with lots of um, uh, stuff to do on, in terms of modeling in our site. So I'm really glad to see that it's uh, now continuing and that there are applications of it, even if to a, um, let's say, less less ambitious skill in modeling terms, but maybe m even more relevance in terms of applicability of the results to a specific topic. So um, just wanted to thank you for the initiative and uh, well done on the work. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks to all our speakers who were so uh, so clear and uh, and took the time to explain to us uh, what what they have been working on. And thank you to all the participants who sent uh, many questions and and uh, stayed throughout the webinar. We are now coming to the end of our of our of our session. Um, we, you may be aware that today's webinar is one of a series that runs up to September 2018, and today we discussed a little bit some of some topics that uh, that will come up in the next series, if in, in the next webinars, such as uh, integrated water resources management, water governance, and also cost benefit analysis um, and cost effectiveness analysis. So you may be interested in signing up for some of the next events if you haven't done so already. Uh, you can do so by uh, registering at the, the link shown. Uh, the the bottom of the slide, we have our next webinar, which is a short introduction to understand cost benefit analysis and cost effectiveness analysis next month at the end of, uh, of May. Um, you will then be sent details on the date and how to, show, how to join the following webinars as well. So uh, again, thanks a lot to all the, our speakers, uh, Dr. Lanzi, Dr. Abdullayev, Dr. Paul, also to the people involved in organizing this webinar, uh, Jean-Gabriel Dus, Sandra Brühlmann, um, uh, Ege also from, from SDC, and Martin Lang from SCAT. And I wish you all a good day. Thank you, and hope to see you soon at one of our next events. <laughs>